Welcome to part 3 of this slider puzzle tutorial. So far we've created our grid and applied the texture to it. We'll now be looking at how we can find the empty square of the puzzle that the pieces will move into. We'll also be creating the very core of how this effect works, which is the algorithm that finds which pieces can be moved each turn or move of the puzzle. So I haven't yet really explained how we're going to actually mix the puzzle, which is the main part of this. And so what we're actually doing is starting off from obviously a solved puzzle state and we are then going to mix it through a series of moves until the puzzle is as mixed as we want it. And to do that we work out where the empty piece is. So if you've ever seen these puzzles in real life they have one piece removed and that's so this piece can now move into that place and then you would continue. So that would move, then that could move. And that's how you begin to mix it. So we're actually going to track the location of where this empty piece is so that we know what objects can move into it. We then keyframe both the piece that is in the empty piece location and the piece that is moving and then move forward in the timeline. And so that's how we build up the animation. So what we need is a function to find out where this empty piece is going to be. So if I just run the script again, well, I always say that it's going to be in the bottom left, which is puzzle one, piece one. So we're going to create a new function called def find empty piece. And the first thing we're going to do is print out a new divider line just to separate this section. And then we're going to define a new empty piece variable. And we're going to set it to be the object that we want to be the empty piece. And that's going to be this bottom left hand one. It can be any piece you want. I just always define it to be the bottom left. And that's going to be puzzle piece one. But we're going to access it by using the name. Because remember, our puzzle could have any name. And then just add one. And to make it a bit clearer, what we can do is change a property in the object properties. And if we set it to solid, then we can separate it from the other pieces. We can see visually that this is going to be our empty piece. So we just need to change this property, which is the draw type property on the object. So I'm going to say empty piece dot draw type equals solid. And actually this has to be all capitals. I'm also going to say that I don't want it to render. So if you've seen up here in the outliner, we've got this camera icon and that's the hide render property. And that's saying, do we want the object to be rendered or not? So I'm going to say hide render equals true. So it won't be rendered. And then one final thing is we're going to print out that we have in fact found the empty piece. So empty piece is and an empty piece dot name. And then just after we've unwrapped it, I'm going to call this find empty piece function. So we can see that it ran and it, it did in fact find this piece and set it to solid. But we're not actually going to call this function here. I put this in as a test, but we're actually going to call it a bit later on. Now we know it's working, we can remove that function call. So now it's time to do the actual animation. We are going to create a new function yet again, and this is going to be our animate pieces function. So the first thing we're going to do, like we did in the unwrap function, we're going to access the global total counter variable and resetting it for when we do our percentage printout. And this is actually where we're going to call the empty piece function that we just created, but we're going to do it in a slightly different way. I'm going to assign a new variable called empty piece, and I'm going to say equals find empty piece. And this is our function. So you may think, well, how can I store the function inside a variable? Well, I'm not actually going to. I'm going to add something 
to this function and I'm going to say return empty piece. So this return, well, it's going to return our empty piece object that we've defined up here. And so when we assign it to a variable, it's going to return this and put it into the variable. So it's a way of transferring data from one function into a variable like this. So you know you could this could return simply a string saying true or false. And so when this was called, this variable would then become that true or false value that it returned. We're just returning the object. And that means we can access this empty piece object here. And the reason why I did this is that it's just creating a hierarchy of code. So having this as a separate function, we can turn off different parts of code. For example, if we're finding we're having a problem with certain parts, we can very easily just comment out this line and it will just disable whole sections of code. So wherever possible, we separate stuff out into its own kind of module, its own separate function, and only call it when necessary. So what our goal is, is to work out which pieces can be moved. And when the object is in the bottom left, only two pieces can be moved, this piece and this piece. And the way we can work out which pieces are available is by simply looking at their location. So we can loop through all objects in our puzzle and say, well, if the Y location is the same as this object, yes, these Y locations are the same as this. And if the X location is the same, but plus one. So we can say its Y location is the same as our empty piece and its X location is increased by one. So that we know that the object is next to it. We can do the same for this piece. We can say, well, if the X location is the same, which it is, but if the Y location has increased by one, then we know it's above it. So this piece must be above it because both those things are true. So then if the empty piece was in the middle here, we would just do a further two tests to say, is it to the left or is the piece to below? So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be looping through all the pieces of our puzzle and checking whether they're next to our empty piece. If they are next to it, if they are above it, below it, to the left or to the right of it, then they are regarded as pieces that can be moved. And we'll then pick one of those movable pieces and swap our empty piece with it. And that will be regarded as one move of the puzzle. So the first thing I'm going to do is create an empty list that can hold our possible movable pieces. So movable pieces equals, and then open and close brackets, that just creates an empty list. And then we're going to have another loop like we did before. So for i in range, and then between 1 and total pieces. And now you may remember that last time we did total pieces plus 1, but we don't actually need to loop through all the objects because one of them is the empty piece. So it's actually fine that we're going up to but not including that total. So for example, in this 4x4 puzzle, we only need to loop through 15 objects in our puzzle because the 16th is our empty piece. And then we're going to say current piece again. So we're going to define a new current piece is equal to. And then we're going to use our name variable again and then convert our loop variable just as we did before. But this time we do need to increase it by one because remember the first piece is going to be our empty piece. So we could say we're starting the search from two to total pieces plus one and that would do pretty much the same thing. But it makes just as much sense to just add one onto the name. It does exactly the same thing. So then we're going to create some more convenience variables and that's what I'm calling this. It's a shortening of this name to make it more convenient. So we're going to do the same to some other properties to make accessing them later a bit easier and make our code a bit more readable. So I'm going to say current x, which is a new variable, is equal to our current piece dot location. And I'm going to access the x location, which is the first item in the list. So I'm storing the x location of this current piece in a variable called current x. But what I actually want to do 
is round this number. So like we did before with the percent, I'm going to type round. Because if we don't do that, we're going to get a very long number. Even though it looks like it's very short, that's just how it's displayed in the user interface. If you printed it out, you'd get a very long number and we need to simplify it. And I'm going to say that I want to simplify it to two decimal places. We're then going to do exactly the same for the current Y. So we can copy this, change this to Y, so it's the second item in the list. And I'm then going to create two more. And these are going to store the positions of the empty piece. So remember, we've found our empty piece by running the find empty piece function. We returned our empty piece and we can now access the properties on that object. So instead of current X, we're going to access empty X. And empty Y. So we're going to access the empty piece location X and the empty piece location Y. We are going to have a rather long if statement now to work out if one of these pieces is above or below this empty piece. And the way we do that is by saying if the current Y, which is that variable we just made, is equal to empty Y and current x equals empty x plus 1. Now what does that do? Well that's what I explained earlier. It's going to loop through these pieces and it's going to say to say this one, it's going to go is this y location the same as the empty piece y location and we can see it is both minus 1.5 so that is a match and is the x, and we need an extra equal sign in there, and is the x the same as the empty x plus 1. The x is minus 1.5 and this is minus 0 0.5, so it is indeed the same as it plus 1, which shows the object must be to the right of it. But that's not the end of the if statement. We're then going to say, or is current x equal to empty x and current y is equal to empty y plus 1. So is this x value the same as this x value? It is. And is the y value the same as this y value, which is 1.5, but plus 1, which it is. But if it checked on this object, it would find that that wasn't true. It's only going to be true of this object. So what we basically said in these two sections is, is the object to the right of the empty piece? Or is it above? But we now need two extra sections of this if statement to say, is it to the left of the empty piece or below the empty piece? But this is getting a bit long for one line. So I'm going to type or, and then a forward slash, and a forward slash means we can continue the if statement on the next line, and I'm just going to copy all of this apart from that final or, and I'm going to paste it in, instead of plus one, it's going to be minus one, and we do the same there, and then we need our final colon. So this is in fact one big statement. It's saying, is the object to the right, above, to the left, or below? So for most of these it will say, no, it's not. This object is not directly to the right of it, not directly above, below, or to the left, so it'll be disregarded. It's only when we get to these two objects that it will say, oh yes, actually, a few of these things are true. And once it finds that they're true, it's saying, yes, they are movable pieces, so they should be added to the list of movable pieces. So if that's true, to add something to a list we can do dot append. So dot append current piece. And what we can do is a nice little but quite long printout. 
So if I just type in a new variable, and this will only be temporary, and we'll just set it to be a one space text variable, and we'll set the answer to be match, we can do a long printout which we can show if it's working or not. So we can say comparing current piece dot name and then a space with converting to a string current y with and then convert to a string empty y and current x with empty x plus answer and then I think we need an extra bracket on the end so let's run that and of course we're not getting anything yet because we haven't actually told it to run and I'm just missing a bracket there and I probably had too many brackets on the end right so now we have a nice printout we should have 15 printouts one for each piece and so it's gone through and this is basically printing out it's saying we're comparing puzzle piece 1 minus 0 0.5 with 1.5 so that's no match and minus 1.5 with minus 1.5 so yeah that's a match it's looking for puzzle piece 2 which is this one and it's found that their x values are the same so it's found it as a match and then it's also found a match with puzzle piece 5 which is this one this is a way of telling that it's working so all that printout was doing this long thing here is just printing out the values we've just been comparing in this if statement and if it has found a match then it's changing our answer to match and if it hasn't then it'll stay at a blank space so when we append our answer on the end if it has found a piece it will say match and if it hasn't well you can't see it but it's just appended a blank space on the end and it's a pretty useful printout seeing if you're actually finding pieces as you're meant to be However, we don't need that now, we know that it's working, so I'll just comment out those, but I'll leave them in there in case I want them later. So the next thing we can do is, again, put in our print statements, and then again at the end, I'll just say animating pieces complete. And we actually want this underneath our empty pieces variable because that is in itself going to print something out. And we also want to change this to animating. So we can see we've unwrapped, found our empty piece, and we've done our animating. And we will a bit later on put in our percentage print function as well. That's it for this part of the tutorial. In the next part, we'll be looking at actually moving and keyframing the pieces before doing some optimising of the code to make the puzzle more efficient at mixing.